Hello everyone and welcome back to my astrophotography channel. Today we're going to be talking about an astrograph, a telescope dedicated for imaging only. Usually they're very fast, they are very small in some cases. They usually range from smaller apertures of 6 to, to 14 inches depending on the manufacturer. The one that I have is a rescue telescope. It came with a lot of problems in collimation and mechanical issues with the focuser that had to be replaced and some problems with the mirror coating that created um, some artifacts on the mirror. Now, those don't affect my image, but they do make the telescope look like a lemon, which it isn't. It actually is an incredible telescope. Um, it is 8 inches aperture or 200 millimeters uh, with an f-ratio of f3, very fast. That gives it a focal length of 600 millimeters. The difference between this telescope and your Celestron Rasas or any other um, astrographs that you can find off the shelf is that it can cover a full frame sensor. Now Rasas technically can cover a full frame sensor at 11 inches, but technical and reality are completely different when you look at the artifacts they produce in the corners. Now, I am using a QHY600 photographic mono camera here and um, chroma 5 nanometer filters. Uh, I have replaced the focuser with a Prima Luce Esato 3.5 inch low profile focuser. It is a beautiful machine. Um, Prima Luce makes some amazing equipment. It is mounted on an Ioptron uh, CEM120 EC2. Again, a beautiful mount. Um, it's got dual encoders. Uh, for most people, I wouldn't recommend that. I think guiding will deal with the rest. Now, the most important thing about this telescope and any reflector, especially the faster one, uh, ones, is collimation. Now, I struggled with this for months. But I ended up giving it to my friend Jim, who is a expert in collimation, and he took it apart, which I don't recommend that to anybody. He collimated it uh, for a few hours at least and got it to a much better shape. And then throughout time, we perfected it to what it is today. Now, this telescope has primary adjustments on the back for the primary it's got a corrector on the front because it's technically a Cassegrain uh, style design. 99% of the time, nobody should touch the corrector on the front because it could lead to pinched optics and many, many other problems because I, I have touched it and broke, broke it. Um, the beautiful thing about this telescope compared to others is it comes in with a built-in four-point tilt plate. And if you adjust the sensor to that tilt plate and they are uh, properly uh, arranged, it will make it very easy to, to fix tilt, which is your worst enemy in this case. Collimation uh, is rather straightforward if it hasn't been touched too much. Now, it is hard to use to begin with because you have to deal with all these factors, collimation, tilt. Uh, you, need, you might need special filters because it's relatively fast. But once you get it going, it is an incredible telescope. And my friend Jim has fixed three so far. Um, and all three are working relatively amazing. I've had other troubles that I'll get to in a sec that I fixed. But let's move on to see some test images. Now, I take my telescopes to the desert, to a Bordel 2 sky, to test them using, you know, emission nebulas and galaxies. In this case... Initially, I took it out with a 128 QHY color camera for the Orion image. It had still had a lot of issues with tilt. As you can see, the stars are slightly deformed here. Um, I could have worked with it the way it was, but I, I am a perfectionist and I want to make sure that these telescopes get a fair uh, representation. The image on the right, the telescope was collimated and the star field was good, but the primary baffle was not blocked, which led to some reflections. As you can see, some of the star reflections off the brighter stars in the Pleiades cluster, plus some of these rings. The image turned out really um, impressive. The detail in the dust is very good for the time I've spent. 
And it helped me identify what my problem is. Obviously, at the time, I was frustrated because I drove a lot of hours to get to the desert and I wanted, you know, a perfect telescope. The most important things for for any telescopes or any equipment is compromise, knowing what works for you and knowing what you can improve on. Today's image is actually going to be a narrow band image because most of the imaging that I do from my backyard is narrow band due to my Bortle uh, 7 sky. So let's look at what I have. Now, it's not a lot of data. It is 4.2 hours per channel and a total of 13 hours. That doesn't mean that uh, the object that I captured is not going to be bright. It just means that for the amount of time that I'm going to show you, the telescope really shined. So let's start with sulfur. Sulfur is a good channel. It's somewhat noisier than hydrogen, but a lot better than uh, oxygen. There's a lot of stars. Because you're imaging at f3, you will see a lot of stars. The core is slightly blown out, and I was really impressed. I cannot stress the importance of calibration again. I know I keep saying it, but you will not get clean data without flats and darks for your CMOS camera. Bias, bias frames I not necessarily will make a big difference on the newer sensors, but the HA data, mind-blowing as usual. The corners of my telescope are not perfect. They are somewhat uh, goofy, but given that it can deliver four hours of extremely well-captured emission data, I personally think that that's a compromise I can live with any day. Even the Triffid Nebula, which is really small, because of the 8-inch eight aperture, eight aperture, excuse me, has pretty good detail. Now, if you look in the sulfur channel, you'll see a lot more. I was really impressed. I have imaged this target many times with a 10-inch and a 12-inch. I was really surprised that this little 8-inch can produce this much detail. And now, let's look at oxygen. Oxygen is always a channel that looks really bad. Not in this case. This case, actually, oxygen looks good. The data here looks really good. I didn't know that the lagoon has, has been spilling, uh, which is stunning once you see it in color. But I didn't know the Triffid had so much oxygen around it. So some amazing surprises. Uh, and that's why you have uh, all of these astrograph telescopes that we use to collect data fast. And the bigger the aperture, the more detail you will see. I think these were um, really good stacks to start with. I would advise people not to make um, any kind of decisions on anything before they stack the final image. I would advise people not to look at a fit that you just captured, one single image, and say, oh, I don't like this. Uh, space objects are dim and we do multiple exposures for a reason. So have patience. Now let's look at the stretched. I won't be doing any kind of advanced synthetic com combinations yet. I will do some tutorials on how I do pixel math and how I do my synthetic luminous channel. But today we're going with a straightforward sulfur for red, hydrogen for green, oxygen for blue. Standard Hubble palette. Um, I stacked the image. I have then stretched it. I removed the green with SCNR. I removed the pink, inverting the image and then applying an SCNR on green on it. And then I did the same thing. I saved the original stretch file for the stars. And then I went to work on the starless image. I use Starnet 2.0. It does a really good job. And the smaller the stars, uh, the tighter the band pass, the better it's going to look. I was really impressed with this and I was starting to see something that I never saw. The fact that there's oxygen spillover from the lagoon. I've seen this uh, nebula imaged many times with, by amazing astrophotographers, but I never saw that it was actually spilling out very dramatically. And then also the, self, uh, the oxygen, the blue around the Triffid Nebula was very, very beautiful. Now, this already looked really uh, impressive. Then I did a color mixing. Again, I've said this a few times. I don't like the golden uh, contrast, a uh, golden um, color scheme that comes with the Hubble palette when you remove the, the green. But I do like th 
to, to take all that gold and throw it towards red, which is the color space is very red. Um, after I did the color mixing in Photoshop, I also did um, a texturization of the image using a high pass filter so that a lot of the details in the nebulosity and the dust shows up. I will do a tutorial on that later. And also I forgot to add in this image, I did a HDR multi transform to bring out the core. As you can see, if you look at this image, the core is starting to look a lot better. It's a lot more clear. You can actually see within it, which is why we want to do that to see the, the inside of the Lagoon Nebula. Now, again, I was really impressed and, and, and happy with this image so far. Now it was time to take it back. Uh, to the space realm and add some stars. Uh, let me close this. I added the stars and I was really impressed with what it looked like. Uh, but I am a perfectionist and I always want to do better. So I looked at this image. I thought, what could I do better? And then I decided to stretch it a little bit more and um, see how much I can get that blue that's spilling out to be visible. Now, I've seen many techniques. There's many amazing channels on YouTube that will teach you a lot of these. I will try my best to teach you how I do it. I've learned from, you know, Chuck's astrophotography from Visible Dark. Um, and I recommend you guys watch all of those channels along with mine. Now, I was really happy with the latest additions, the curves and the stars being added. And I thought, how, what, what's a, the best way to do this, but to compare it to the initial the initial image. So this is my initial image of the lagoon. It's not a bad image. It's kind of soft because I had to do more star reduction and more noise reduction, and they all come with a compromise. So once I did that, I was somewhat happy with this image, but again, star reduction and other things, the moment you don't protect the stars, things like this happen where clear differences between colors where red stars were a little bit bigger or had flaring will show up more than the hydrogen channel or the blue channel. Now, again, depends on the stars and the imaging. It could be uh, any of them. In this case, sulfur was uh, saturating the stars and making it almost look like hot or cold pixels uh, for the, the hot pixels and then cold for the, the oxygen. Now, again, nebulosity wise, I, I like it, but here's what I came up with. And I was actually, um, I'm pretty impressed with this image. Um, it is um, capturing the kind of dramatic scene that happens in the Lagoon Nebula. I will do a mosaic in the future to capture the bottom of the mosaic. Uh, I did not have time now. This target is quite low on the horizon for me. And I have a neighbor with uh, a lot of floodlights and it is hard to get a lot of time. I think I imaged more than a week to get this data. So I'm actually really happy with the image on the right, the final image. I look forward to everybody's comments and um, maybe you like the one on the left. I definitely respect that. I am a designer for my day job. I get people's opinions uh, thrown at me all day and I respect them. And, and I think it's important that we all have an opinion, but be respectful about how we push it to each other. Now, if you're thinking about getting an astrograph, I think that's a good idea. The only thing about any space, uh, imaging equipment is patience. You will need time to learn the equipment, to learn how to use it, to learn what compromises you have to live with. And this, this happens on all telescopes. Um, even the ones you hear that are perfect astrographs or even some refractors. So have patience with yourself and your equipment, ask other people for help. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on YouTube and I will leave you with the final image. Now, if you like the content that I'm producing, feel free to subscribe, leave a comment. Do whatever you want to do to be um, in the know for when I publish more videos. The next video I will be publishing is going to be on a target that's going to be collected on uh, captured only in hydrogen and oxygen. Um, astrophotographers refer to that as HOO. That's actually the mapping of the colors hydrogen for red, oxygen for green, 
and oxygen for blue as well. It is, in my opinion, the best target to do that in, and it is not the Veil Nebula. Uh, I've imaged that many times, and I have some decent images of it. This is a different target where the oxygen actually is the primary element to image. Thank you for your time. If you like my videos, feel free to follow my work on Instagram and Astrobin. And let me know if you have any comments, suggestions, or just want to leave a comment. Thank you.